just want to say we're going to record. Yeah. Okay, thank you all for coming to this informational session on the Santa Maria River Healthy Watershed Initiative, also known as a Clean Water Team. We are um, Santa Barbara County Action Network and Creeklands Conservation are working together to do a project that uh, looks at the entire watershed of the Santa Maria River. And the first part of that is to do some water testing out in the Guadalupe Beach area, just north of there, actually in the Santa Maria River estuary. So we're gonna explain what that's all about. We'd like to let you know uh, that what we're doing and ask you to participate if you're interested. If not, and you know someone who might be, let them know, but we would hope that uh, we can get put a team together to do that water quality testing. And as part of a, a greater effort that over time we hope to develop to uh, improve the water quality of the entire watershed. And Tim is gonna be talking about the, um, what all those, um, the watershed part, aspects are, the, the more technical and the, not, you know, not necessarily terribly technical, but, um, more informational parts. So we're going to start a slideshow. Uh, Tim, did you want to start that or do you want us to, to do yeah, that? Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen um, okay. so we can do it that way. That's, let's do that. Uh, the first slide is coming up. It talks about who uh, Santa Barbara County Action Network is. And I'm the Associate Director of Santa Barbara County Action Network. Nadia is the, um, the Director of advocacy and uh, events. And Ken Huff is the executive director and he's waving his hand right there. And I didn't actually uh, talk with anyone about whether we'd like to do some uh, quick introductions before we go on. There's a lot of people, so um, I'm not sure if, I, I don't really think we have time for that uh, unless, I hear, unless I hear differently from you guys. Now, Tim, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, and so um, we have a couple different, so there's a different slide deck that, um, that I'm gonna use today, but I am gonna just throw up that SBCAN slide that you mentioned, and then switch over to um, my more detailed presentation. Um, so here we go. Okay. Okay. So folks should be able to see my screen. And this is just a little bit about Santa Barbara County Action Network, also known as SBCAN. We are an organization started in 2002 to build bridges between the north and the south parts of the county and between environmental and social justice organizations. We work on a variety of topics that range from social, environmental, and economic justice. We meet once every, we meet twice a month actually to, to talk about specific topics. Um, from oil drilling and pipelines to uh, preserving farmland, affordable housing. And um, this is a new project for us to get involved in watershed quality, water quality in the Santa Maria River watershed. Um, we invite you all to uh, become members of SBCAN if you'd like to, or just sign up for our action alerts at sbcan.org. And we are really excited to be working with Creek Lands Conservation on this project. So. I'll popcorn it back to Tim. Yeah, likewise. Oh, um, oh, so, go ahead. So this one slide is just about our clean water team. We're going to talk about more, talk about that more at the end um, to see who would like to be involved in that. It doesn't take a lot of time, but to get you out in the estuary or either in a kayak or on the shore to do the water quality testing. Um, this picture is of um, in August when I was there and there were thousands of pelicans. It's just amazing to me how beautiful it is out there. And I, I'd been on Guadalupe Beach before, but I hadn't realized all the pelicans that hung out at the estuary. So it's quite a beautiful, wonderful resource. And I know Jim Snodgrass likes to take pictures. Maybe he'd want to go out there and take some pictures. So, <laughs> okay, so back to you, Tim. Awesome, thank you. Um, let me pick, here we go. Okay, so, um, Thank you for that introduction. So my name's Tim. I work at Creeklands Conservation. I'm a hydrologist there. Um, I also um, handle lots of our water quality monitoring. 
and have some experience in this estuary. And um, you know, previously we've done some work with cause as well at the estuary volunteer trainings, and we are, are continuing that and um, making some improvements as well to our how we monitor the estuary. And we can get a lot done with volunteer help. And so I'm just going to kind of explain the background of the estuary, a little bit of science, nothing, nothing too serious. And you don't have to understand everything that I'm going to present to you. But if you're interested in how the watershed works and how the estuary works, um, I think you'll like this. Uh, so here's our mission. I'm going to talk a little bit about Creek Lands up top. It's to conserve and restore watersheds and the connected nearshore mar marine ecosystems throughout California's central coast through conservation science, education, and stewardship action. So um, today we're doing a bit of education, we're doing a bit of science, and um, we're gonna bring you in to help with some stewardship as well. A uh, little background history. We were founded in 1983. We were called Central Coast Salmon Enhancement for many years, and then we rebranded as Creeklands Conservation in 2019. And that was just to reflect a change in how we did things. We started as Salmon Enhancement because in this picture, you can actually see there are salmon pens. We used to raise salmon and release them uh, for uh, recreational use. But we've, we've come a long way since then, and we do a lot of different things now, um, largely you know, habitat restoration and conservation. And uh, some background about why this is all happening now. We are in uh, kind of the second phase. Uh, we, we started last year working with the Rose Foundation to get some legs under us for water quality monitoring in the estuary and, and Santa Maria River watershed outreach. Just getting folks interested in their, their watershed. This is a really important um, community and river and uh, we think it's just, it needs to shine a little more and we're, we're here to help people do that. And for our current projects, We've kind of got four components going on. Estuary water quality monitoring, which is where you come in. There's also, this is going to support some other efforts like watershed or watershed report card, which will help communicate to the public, like the health of the Santa Maria River and its watershed. Um, we're gonna be continuing to do education and outreach in the community and then stakeholder development, really try to get enough interest going in the river and the watershed so that people start advocating for this environment if they feel that they have a, a good connection to it. So I hope to help you guys create a nice connection with this uh, environment as well. So let's talk a little bit about the volunteer experience that we're setting you up for. So first of all, I think you're gonna love seeing your estuary from a new perspective, or if you've never been there, maybe your first perspective. It's beautiful. I've seen many estuaries on the Central Coast, and this is one of my favorites. Um, you'll learn how to use some scientific equipment. Some of you may be familiar with using different water quality meters and measuring things, um, but if you've never even held a thermometer, um, you're still going to be able to help us collect data. We're going to show you all of it. You'll also be able to work with other people in your community, uh, form bonds over um, the, the science that you're going to contribute to and um, become an advocate for your environment. So I'll just break this up into three parts, roughly. We're just gonna talk about the Santa Maria River estuary, what it is, why we care about it, a little bit of water quality science, and then wrap up with what exactly we'll be doing out in the field. And I wanna emphasize, you don't have to have any science knowledge prior to this to participate and to get things done. So here's a picture of the estuary. Well, it's the, the river just upstream of the beach. And here's kind of just an overview of the watershed, as we call it. Um, I'm gonna go into that concept a little more. Let me put on my laser pointer. So all of this black boundary is the, the Santa Maria River watershed. Some of it's kind of cut off here. Every raindrop that falls within here is going to make its way out to the ocean eventually, or it'll sink into the ground or evaporate. But that's what the watershed is. Every, wherever the water falls in here, it's coming out to the ocean. 
And we can just see kind of a flow line here. I want you to just know that all the water's flowing over this way to the west. And your major components of the watershed are the Sisquoc River, which is not labeled here, the Cuyama River, which has a, a dam on it. You may have heard that before. Here's the city of Santa Maria in Guadalupe to help you orient yourselves. And uh, it terminates in the estuary. That is where all of this water runs through and touches the ocean. Um, so really down here, the water is kind of carrying its memory of everything it's done in the, the watershed. And just to kind of like help you visualize watersheds a little more, this is a simple drawing um, of a watershed. And so they're just uh, showing you that boundary line here. That's the watershed divide. And a little history of the Santa Maria River helps you understand where it is now, and where it's come from. Flooding was a huge part of the Santa Maria River's history. And recently, um, there was still flooding going on, especially down near Guadalupe, but some other areas got flooded. It was a constant battle with floods, so it became important to uh, dam this up, or I'm um, sorry, create some levees. Uh, it was you know, very costly. It was happening very frequently. So um, some levees were built, and um, I think a really big project in 2008, $40 million went toward repairing the levee. And so I, I'm bringing this up because the community noticed an issue with this water resource. It was flooding them, and um, its money was spent to fix that. But there's another side of the Santa Maria River's um, quality, which is the water quality. And... You know, we're hoping to draw some more attention to that as well, because that that does require money and community advocacy to get projects. Um, and then this is Twitchell Reservoir on the Kuyama River. Um, that was also kind of built to help control some flooding as well. OK, so what is the estuary? Let's, let's get to the estuary. I'll just give you a quick definition and an example. So. The definition is it's a partial, partially enclosed coastal body of brackish water, brackish just meaning salty and freshwater mix, um, with one or more rivers or streams flowing into it and with a free connection to the open sea. And so Morro Bay is a great example of that. Um, we've got an inlet here that's, that's open to the sea. Choro Creek drains in here, so does Los Osos Creek. And it's um, connected through the tides and the water kind of varies. Sometimes it's very salty. Um, when the tides come in, it can be fresher when the tides go out and there's lots of fresh water coming in. So it's a very dynamic system. Um, and so specifically, the Santa Maria River estuary is um, where the, the river is meeting the ocean and um, it's formed a, a lot of you know, sand dunes over time, um, the ocean has pushed these up and the river is pushing sediment down. And so they're combining to make this feature. Uh, I'm just going to show a little more history here. In 1938, you can see these dunes are relatively untouched. There wasn't that much activity here. By 1961, in this photo, um, some oil development had gone in. And you can still see remnants of that oil development today. Um, and it's actually still an active site. So that changed some of the land uses around here. And then down here, you can see the development of agriculture that, um, that also has a, a role in the water quality of the estuary. Okay, so why is there an estuary there? It's basically just these two opposing forces of the river and the ocean and they're kind of duking it out, and the estuary is just evidence of that. So um, here, this is not the Santa Maria River, but it's a good example. It's a nice shot. We have a river coming out to meet the ocean, and sometimes, especially like we had uh, earlier this month, the river is kind of winning this battle. It's forcing its way out, connecting to the ocean. Um, but then when those flows recede, the ocean is constantly pushing sand up through its waves, and it can block this off with um, a sandbar. So a lot of our coastal creeks you'll find um, 
are kind of temporarily open to the ocean and then they close off as things dry up as the, the rivers and creeks lose their, their force on the, the sandbar. And so to just bring that to the Santa Maria estuary, in this satellite photo, you can see where the sandbar has formed. This is the river coming in to the estuary, very low flow in this picture. So, you know, it's just kind of water trickling in. And um, you can see just the way this is shaped where it had breached when it was open a few months before. It's almost like you could draw a line straight out here. And so that, that river was just flowing into the ocean. Once the ocean built it back up, it filled in, and then these areas filled in as well. You get this great expansion of habitat. And so this habitat, this water um, feature has several uses and benefits. One, one of my favorites is scenery. It's just, it's great to look at. Um, recreation, um, there's great bird watching out there, for example. Um, there's great fish habitat as well. We'll talk a little more about this, um, but you know, estuaries in general are great habitat for fish, uh, unless they're they're not maintained or if they are polluted. Um, for example, in this case, this estuary is actually quite contaminated with DDT. Um, there are herbicides and fungicides likely present, um, nitrates from fertilizer runoff. Despite that, there actually are still several organisms using it, but um, it could be better. And we'll talk a little more about that. And this is just a shot of it when it's open. So you can see that the river is punched out, it's connected to the ocean, and you can just see the difference in how much is flooded there. Once that sandbar closes up, this is gonna become inundated. Um, and the Santa Maria River does not necessarily breach every year. If we don't get enough flow, um, the, the basin upstream of this estuary can soak up so much water into the ground that um, in really dry years, you don't get any breaches, which um, this year uh, we did breach. Okay, so part two, water quality. What are we doing here? Um, let's just define water quality for our purposes. I'm just gonna say it's the physical and chemical measurements of water. It's how hot or cold it is, how fresh or salty, clear or cloudy. Uh, are there a lot of nutrients in the water or is it, does it have poor nutrients? And how high or low is the oxygen in that water? And so when we talk about water quality, um, a lot of times you might hear it in the context of drinking water, you know, how much lead is in your water. These things are all defined in terms of how human beings consume water but there's a environmental water quality aspect that is important as well. And so we talk about them a little differently. Like for example, in your tap water, you probably don't care how much oxygen is in it, but for the environmental purposes, we, we do care about that. And why do we care about it? Um, I've kind of come up with this trifecta that I hope finds a, somebody can find their place in it, um, no matter who you are. There's community uses, um, whether you like fishing, swimming, scenery, uh, just relaxing by the, the ocean um, with your community and kind of bring that in, in as a sense of place. Or the economy, um, you know, the Morro Bay estuary is a very popular, it's, it's iconic, and um, that brings in a lot of tourism. And so some people really value, if you ask them, why do they care about the water quality of Morro Bay, they might just say, brings jobs and that's that's a fine reason um, as well as for growing food and, and property values these are other things that uh, water quality is important for and then ecology this is kind of my one of my personal favorites but um, it the ability of fish birds mammals and plants to use the water and to thrive uh, that's another important part and these all have connections your community is connected to its ecology your ecology and your economy are connected and, and so on. Um, and this is just to illustrate one way of thinking about the ecology uh, aspect. You know, water quality affects the whole food chain. And if you have a water quality disturbance here low on the food chain, 
um, it can disrupt everything that follows all the way up to the, the fishermen or the, the birds. In this case, uh, DDT, right, is a great insecticide. It, it kills insects very effectively, but they're a really important intermediate part between you know, this algae, which they feed on, um, and then they feed, the insects feed fish and, and everybody above that. And so when so much DDT has been flushed into that estuary, uh, you should ask yourself, how are these arrows being disrupted? Um, from the baseline, from, from what it was before uh, those interruptions existed. Okay, so what are we measuring in the estuary, this group? Um, we could measure, you can measure anything in water, really. You could look for any chemical you want. Um, but we're going to start with the basics and kind of the most important ones from my perspective, from our perspective. Uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity. It's also convenient that these are fairly simple to measure compared to something like um, PDT. Luckily, somebody's already measured that for us. We'd, we'd like to continue to get new measurements for that, but we know that's a problem and we can start addressing that. But we still are learning whether there's any problems with temperature or dissolved oxygen um, or salinity. Um, and so this is kind of an open, we have an open, um, opportunity here. Like there are other things that could be monitored in the future. We just need to start building this platform for, for all of you to start participating in the water quality monitoring. And then as a community, people can navigate what else they want to uh, find out about the estuary. So why temperature? It's important for everything, right? Um, there's just temperatures that you can survive within. Um, or thrive in, in this case, like let's use the steelhead, for example, steelhead trout. They thrive in temperatures of 55 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's kind of just the basic rule I use when I'm looking at a body of water on the central coast, fresh water. Um, you know, is it too warm or too cold for fish? I, I kind of use this threshold. We don't really have to worry about too cold, but in several places, things do get very hot and that can stress fish out. Uh, so we can monitor this very easily, and it's great to just confirm whether the water conditions are, are conducive to a fish, like swimming around and enjoying life, or, you know, if you can imagine yourself panting in the heat, running around. Um, sometimes temperatures can become fatal, even, for fish. Uh, we also want to monitor dissolved, dissolved oxygen. It's just the, it's the source of oxygen for aquatic organisms, just like oxygen is in the air that you're breathing right now. There is oxygen suspended in the water and fish are breathing that into their gills um, or you know, other organisms are just absorbing it through their skin. High levels are usually better and very low levels tend to kill most organisms. Um, sometimes you're, you've got like a crawfish, they can survive at very low levels. You might notice that in like pretty poor water quality. You won't see any fish, but you'll still see those little crawfish around. Um, that's one example of how dissolved oxygen kind of separates out different organisms and how they ad adapt. Um, and how does the oxygen get in there? Most of it is through just diffusion. If you just put a glass of water out in the air, it's gonna absorb um, some dissolved oxygen or it's going to dissolve oxygen into it. Um, other ways are aeration. So if you like um, to shake up a bottle of water, you'll actually be forcing oxygen into it. And um, this is just a little bit of chemistry for those who care, but the, it's just a visualization. The oxygen molecules are kind of dancing with the, the water, but um, depending on conditions in the water, this oxygen can take off. It can, it can gas out and leave uh, through diffusion. So it, it goes both ways. And so we're going to measure this. Uh, we're going to measure dissolved oxygen with a sensor like this. Um, salinity, pretty straightforward. You know, it's how salty the water is, um, and it tells us about you know, how much ocean water is in the estuary. So the saltier the water, the closer it is to like how salty the sea is. That tells us, you know, how close or um, how much ocean waters in our estuary. 
So when we have lots of fresh water moving in, that salinity drops. And when the ocean starts splashing in or starts seeping into the estuary, it gets saltier. And that just dictates what kind of organisms can live in there and uh, at what stage in, for example, a, a trout's life cycle, um, the, what fish are doing when the, the sorry, it, it dictates what fish can do um, at different times of year. Um, and then again, a little science. This is like a, a helpful graphic. Imagine this is your estuary, this, this body of water here. You've got your ocean, and this is the, as salty as it gets, right? The ocean. And then you have fresh water coming in from your, your river. They're going to mix, and you're going to get a gradient. You're going to get uh, slightly salty to very salty water. And this gradient introduces a lot of um, rich diversity and habitat. And so you can find uh, many different organisms as you um, go from fresh to salty. And so when we go in here with our, our salinity meters, we're gonna start figuring out um, what condition the estuary is in with respect to this kind of graphic. graphic. <clears throat> um, and then just to kind of help you understand, fresh water is between zero and 0.5 parts per thousand. That's just, grams of salt per gram of water, over a thousand grams of water. So 35 grams of salt in a thousand grams of water is like pickle juice, that's, that's seawater. Um, you usually can't taste 0.5. Seawater is really salty. I'm sure you've all experienced that. And then the estuary can be anywhere in between that. Um, it varies quite a bit. And so why did we choose these parameters to monitor? Um, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity. Um, it's largely based on the organisms that we care about, fish, insect larvae. Um, I'm sure there's a connection to birds, but I'm not thinking about it. And um, we know that fish need relatively cool water, oxygen to breathe, clear water to hunt in, and things to eat. Um, insects, in order to be eaten, and supply the rest of the food chain, need less pesticides. Um, and then also um, community uses and goals will also inform what, what we monitor. Okay, so how can you measure water quality? There's two ways people generally measure water quality. You can get a bottle, fill it up and send it to a lab, which is um, expensive and, and time consuming. Or you can go out there with a device that measures the water quality parameter you're interested in and just stick it in the water. That's what we're doing. And that's a lot of what I do in my, my day to day. Um, we're going to use a water sampler, something like it's going to be uh, what's in this picture. Um, this is just an example of how it's used. Um, in some cases, you go out on a boat and drop it in. Uh, we are going to stand from the shore on, on training day. Um, just to get everybody a chance uh, to access the equipment, whether or not you're comfortable with the kayak or know how to use one. Um, we're going to start on the, the shoreline um, and use a device to kind of help get this, this uh, little further out over the water. And we're going to try to figure out what the water quality is doing toward the top of the water column and then down on the bottom. Um, because there's differences. You can, if you've ever jumped in the lake, and it's kind of this warm layer on top, and then you jump in and your toes get really cold when you get deeper. There's a separation in water quality that happens. And so this device is gonna help us figure out what's going on at the top and, and the bottom. And then we're going to show you how to use this equipment, um, take notes in the field. Um, so if you, if you don't have any experience, you know, logging scientific measurements, um, you're gonna, learn how to do that. Um, and so there's a, a few things that'll happen in the field. You'll get your hands on the equipment. You'll learn what the measurements are um, and maybe get like a, a better intuitive sense of what you're measuring. Um, we also need to figure out um, some logistics. Uh, directions to the estuary, right? And then also safety, we're gonna talk about safety a lot in the field. I won't go over it today, 
Um, but just things, our number one priority is to keep you safe while you're out there. And right now that's scheduled for Saturday, January 28th. The floods were pretty significant. And so last I checked, the road to the estuary is still closed, but I'm hopeful that it will um, drain out and that the Santa Barbara Parks Department will be able to clear the road. But uh, that is actually still up in the air. So stay tuned. Um, and then in terms of bringing anything, we're, we're gonna bring all the equipment you need. Really all I suggest is like some layers. It can be cold and windy out there depending on the time of day, um, but it can also be warm. Sunglasses are great too because of how much wind there is and uh, maybe a towel, um, just something you'd like to bring to the beach, bottles of water uh, and sunscreen. And there will be other documents provided like a, a monitoring plan so that people can kind of like refer back to uh, a document, like how to measure these things, how to fill out the data. And uh, we'll always be available to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're just interested in exploring the, the science of estuary water quality or hydrology, um, uh, I'm happy to answer those questions as well um, here and, and uh, in the future. All right, that's it. Thank you very much, Tim. I'd like to come uh, back into this just for a minute. I've got just a few slides to show very yeah. briefly. I'll stop and, you uh, If I can share my screen um, as soon yeah, as Tim to... undoes sharing. Working on it. It's... So I was out there the other day with my drone and I took some pictures of what the uh, area looks like right now. And there's three feet of water right after the beginning of the roadway um, that's flooding the roadway. And then that's why we, we don't know whether they're gonna be able to go out there on Saturday. We're keeping in touch with the Parks Department to see how quickly that drains and whether it'll get, be possible to get there. I also have some pictures that um, I took in August of uh, the estuary from the beach side. So this first one is uh, the entrance to the park is right here and you can get to the entrance, but it's closed because you can't go very far. When you turn it, the road goes over this way and then it is flooded right there. So this is what it looks like. This is your road under this mud and water right here. And it winds around past the sand um, processing place and out here and then somewhere out there. Here's the estuary over here. The river flows different through different creeks here. And uh, it decided it's flowing over here where we didn't want it. And mm -hmm. that's what <laughs> that's what water does. So here's another view of it looking out. There's the sand processing facility. Um, just to show you some tributaries that run or creeks or I don't know, Tim will tell you the exactly what these are called. Uh, so we're getting closer to the beach. And here, that area where you showed you before that there was a sandbar it went across here. So that has broken through. The water is going out into the ocean. Uh, this area is not backed up like it was um, in the pictures he was showing you. This is just a little closer view of that. Mm -hmm. So this is where your fish would have a chance to swim upstream if there's flow for long enough and they can get where they need to go for um, for breeding purposes. And um, so we would hope that we can, you know, do something to enhance that in the future. This is a, I was, this is from August when I was there, when the sandbar was still there and um, taking pictures of the pelicans, thousands of pelicans, thousands of, of uh, seagulls, some other birds. So it, it's quite a wonderful, exciting place to be if you like birds, like taking pictures of the birds. Um, 
and and who knew? I mean, I I've been out to Guadalupe Beach quite a few times, but I've never been to the estuary until August. And I thought, wow, that's something else. So this is where we are now. And um, we're hoping that if this is something you'd like to be involved in, we're starting this clean water team. Um, this part online training is right now. Infield training is, oh, we don't know, we'll see. Might be Saturday from nine to 11. And most of you have signed up at sbcan.org so we can keep you in the loop. If you haven't, uh, please do. Um, and here's just our uh, our website again. So I'd like to talk with Tim about logistics. So if we do end up there Saturday at nine, are we meeting in the parking lot? And are we gonna go over some information there before we go to the estuary? Um, or are we going to do all the explanation at the estuary? I'm sure we want to meet in the parking lot, but then I don't know if we want to do the instruction there or go to the estuary for it. So let's go ahead yeah. and talk about that. Yeah, thanks. We'll we'll meet in the parking lot and just wait for everybody who signed up to show up. Um, and we'll have like a, I think we should set like a departure time so that uh, if anybody shows up late, they, they know where to follow us. But um, we'll like, hand out papers, materials uh, in person in the parking lot, just go over what we'll be doing. And then we'll walk um, about a quarter mile down the sand to the estuary from the parking lot. And that's where we will set up the water quality equipment and start doing our demonstrations. So I'd like to open it now for questions and um, actually, well, before you guys go, I'd like to know who um, really thinks they're going to be able to make it if we do go on Saturday. I know some of you just came on because you wanted to get information, um, but then I would just like to see how many of you do think you'd be able to make it on Saturday. Actually, we could, yeah, if you just give a little thumbs up right now, that would be great. We can get a, an idea. Of course, I got to put my own thumb up. Thumb up. Give you all a moment to do that. Jenny, I put something in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Lawanda. Thank you. So next time I, I, I would like to be involved. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. So um, let's have a little chat now. Who has questions or comments that they'd like to make? If you can just uh, do the little raise hand button down at the bottom of your screen under reactions, then uh, it'll be easy to track who wants to talk and I can just call on you that way. Okay, do you say Nita or Netta? It's Netta. Oh, I just put a question in the chat. Um, if there is another opportunity to do field training if we can't attend on Saturday. We will be setting up other ones and we don't have them set up yet, but we, uh, we do want to set them up for the future. So we may not end up on their, their Saturday. So we're probably going to have to, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We are hoping still that we can get there Saturday, but we may have to reschedule that one. But uh, if you're signed up at sbcan.org, we will let you know about upcoming ones. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ken Huff. Thank you. When um, I was out there with, with Jeannie when she got those pictures and it was really wonderful. And there were signs that said, you know, not to go uh, very close. Maybe there was even a wire strung across or something. And so I wonder, how is that going to be? And are we going to be disturbing a thousand pelicans if we approach the water? How are we going to deal with that? Yeah, there are some, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some environmental constraints, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, at different times of year, there's, for example, snowy plover, signage up and that's uh, blocked off, but that doesn't prevent us from going accessing uh, the water. It just prevents us from walking on certain parts of the beach. And so we will observe, you know, um, all of uh, Santa Barbara parks restrictions and adapt to them if they change in the future. Right now, obviously anything related to flood or safety, we're just gonna have to wait for them to give us the green light and we'll be in communication with them to make sure everything's, uh, you know, above board. 
Okay, and let me ask you, I should have done this before, but when you uh, when you speak to say who you're with as well, so we get an idea of, of um, organizations that are being represented here, or you can even say um, how you found out about this and why you're interested. That would be nice. So uh, Jessica, please. Hi there. Um, I was just curious about the time commitment or um, I noticed in the email it said, or in the flyer, once a month. And so just how you're going to determine that and if there's going to be teams or what that's kind of looking like. Thank you for that question. I had thought that um, Creeklands had wanted people who could commit to once a month. And I've since found out that really they're wanting the water to be tested at least once a month. So uh, if you can only go out once, you're still a benefit. But if you if we find that there's four people who want to go out, go out each month, then we could test the water quality four times a month. Um, so we would we would ask you to go out with at least one other person for safety and to get work with us on a schedule so that we can um, plan out when the testings are happening uh, and get something that's happening at least once a month, if not more. Um, Tim, did you want to add to that? Yeah, with, with the number of people who are interested here, there's really no, um, you can only, you know, show up once a quarter, but you really want to do it. That's not going to stop us from having you, having you on board. Um, and if you can show up every week, then keep, you know, show up every week. And I think part that's part of the kind of community involvement aspect is if we can just get enough people coordinated and, you know, people's schedules are always changing. If you say, oh, I can't show up this week, but I thought I would, then, you know, somebody else on the team, you can tag them in, ask them if they're free. Um, it, uh, you're not going to be, you know, married to a single schedule. Does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Jessica, um, are you with a certain organization? Uh, yeah, I well, I'm doing this individually, but I work at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, do we have uh, do we have some other questions? How about let's go around and, and um, intro introduce ourselves to each other. Well, let me tell you, do one little housekeeping thing and then we'll just go and, and you can, we'll, we'll just have chat until you have to leave. But in terms of what we're gonna be doing, um, we're gonna keep in touch with Parks Department and find out whether we can go there on Saturday. And as soon as we know one way or another, we'll let you know. Um, we'll definitely let you know before Saturday. And then we will uh, send out the information on what you need to bring that, that Tim talked about before. We'll make a list of those things to remind you what to bring, when to meet us there and what we're doing that day so that you don't have to have, remember everything that we talked about um, today. So we'll, we'll update all of that. Daniel, Daniel, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel, pronouns he, him, his, and I'm a youth and young adult community organizer with Cause. And I actually had a really quick question. Um, I know, Tim, that when we did this last time, there was a couple forms that you requested me to send over for folks that were underage. I don't know if that's something that we would be doing again this time. I know I have like four youth leaders on this call who are interested in going on Saturday. So just wanted to make sure. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a, a liability waiver that um, everybody should review, and we'll send that out ahead of time um, in electronic form, and then a paper form will be provided for you to fill out um, when, when you get in the field. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you, Daniel. I'm excited to hear that you have some youth that want to go out there. Um, Okay, how about uh, Jim Snodgrass? Would you like to introduce yourself? If you can get your uh, microphone to work. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm Jim Snodgrass, retired. Uh, have a lot of hobbies. Uh, this was very interesting to see that we can go there. I've never been to this part of the country as far as uh, Guadalupe, things like that. I do a lot of fishing. And I'm also involved with a 
uh, San Luis Obispo uh, Estuary, going back to Morro Bay, doing studies for the steelhead, and work with the biologists up there. And this sound like uh, as far as a fishery, things like that, especially with steelhead. Uh, I would be interested to uh, see how this turns out. So I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you for coming. And uh, let's see, Leo, please introduce yourself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Leo Ortega here with uh, MICOP, uh, Mixteco Indigenous Community Organizing Project. Uh, you know, um, this uh, program seems really amazing. And I do have a question regarding uh, about capacity since we do have a group of indigenous youth uh, who are interested and are into like uh, biology um, they're in high school right now. So I was thinking, um, would there be any other trainings available specifically for um, the indigenous youth, our uh, youth group who would like to like take part of this uh, program? That we would love to uh, set up a special training and we can do that. We would have to work with you on uh, what you would need us to provide and how many um, students would wanna be involved with that. And I think it's really exciting. I'd love to be able to set up a special thing for them. Um, of course, they're, they're welcome to come out with, uh, if any of them want to come out with the regular, the, the, the group on Saturday, they're welcome to do that, but I'd love to set up a separate time that works for, for your group. Definitely. Thank you. I, I'll um, send you a direct email to okay. organize and coordinate um, um, the, uh, the, the training. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Very, I'm very excited about that. Okay, who else would like to introduce themselves and, and talk about um, your interest in this? I'd love to hear from all of you. I can introduce myself. Um, my name is Netta, and I also work at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Thanks to Jessica, I was became aware of this um, organization and the volunteer opportunity. Um, and yeah, I'm just really interested in getting out um, to Guadalupe and learning more about water quality monitoring. Uh, most of my work at the Botanic Garden is involving habitat restoration. Um, and so learning more about um, riparian plant communities. And so I feel like it'd be a good skill to have some water monitoring experience. Wonderful, that's so good to hear that. Thank you. All right, who would, who would like to jump in next? Uh, Denise. Hi, my name is Denise Elamine, and I am a resident of Solvang, California. Um, I was invited by um, Lawanda, um, and um, I'm here because I realized that water is a big deal in these towns. They make lots of deals, and they spend lots of money on water. So I need to learn more about water quality and all of these water issues and these water boards and these water um <clears throat> water is 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 like gold um in California so I'm hoping to um learn a lot more about water so that I can bring it back to my city and have a better understanding on of how they're making these contracts and what they're doing with our water I don't want to end up like um Mississippi or Flint and can't drink the water so thank you, thank you, I appreciate this. And I hope that um, I learn a lot more. Oh, that's a good perspective to bring to the floor. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, who wants to, who's next? Um, I'll, I'll introduce myself, sorry. Oh no. I'm Lawanda Lyons Pruitt and I'm on the uh, board of SBCAN. So naturally I'm in interested because I'm on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Lawanda. Lawanda is involved in just about everything, and we really appreciate her uh, involvement in SB Can. She's the president of the Lompoc, Santa Maria Lompoc NAACP, and I think she has that position for life um, <laughs> <laughs> because she does such a great job. We we really like it and we really like having her involvement with us. Okay, and uh, Luke. Hi, my name is Luke Blackwire, and I'm a biology professor at Allen Hancock College. And I'm actually going to introduce Farida also. You'll see her name there. She's instructing lab right now, so she can't um, 
come away from that, but she wanted to be in on the meeting. Um, so I teach marine biology. We've actually been um, collecting water data at uh, the estuary at Guadalupe Dunes Preserve for about three, three and a half years now. Um, and uh, Farida teaches oceanography. So she's highly interested in this also. So uh, we're here just to get the information and look at, um, you know, the, the data process that you guys are doing and see how we can incorporate that into our classes and also contribute to this group. Um, I'd like to know more about the data you collected. What period of time was that and how often do you go out there? Uh, we go out once in the fall and once in the spring uh, because the course is a semester course. So uh, we go out um, and the exact date and time changes per semester because my labs change um, depending on the tide height. Um, usually we like to go out at lower lower tides. Um, so it's not, it hasn't been consistent, but it's been consistent as in we've been gathering it twice a year. Um, uh, I'm gonna actually talk with Tim later today um, after this meeting and I'll share that data with him then. And you said for about three years you've been doing that? Yeah, I have three years in the spreadsheet, um, but I think I've done it three and a half, and I don't know what happened to that first year's data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know about data. I, I, I'm looking for three years of pictures right now, so uh, <laughs> I'm really frustrated. Um, okay, who would like to, to uh, introduce themselves next or have anything to say? Okay, um, Louis, I don't know how to say your name, I'm sorry. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Louis Andaloro. I'm the, I live in Santa Barbara. I'm the uh, vice president of the board of the Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council, which is a local uh, watershed advocacy group that's active in the Santa Barbara region. And um, yeah. I have a question for Tim, and that is, um, it would seem to me that each of the rivers coming into the estuary before they meet, it would be uh, interesting to look at the water quality and sample the different sources coming into the estuary instead of just the estuary. And I was wondering what you thought of that. Um, yeah, it's true that it's uh, really interesting to collect water quality data at, at various points in the watershed, um, especially at confluences of, of two rivers or more, um, because you can kind of see which which one is contributing what problem or solution uh, to the water. But um, in this case, uh, we have a pretty good idea about the, the sources of the, the pollutants that we're, we're thinking about. Um, there is some future monitoring happening on in a, a separate effort. It's a little more, um, you know, kind of a, a rigorous uh, scientific endeavor, but uh, this will be helping with that. And uh, definitely to the, to the degree that this um, kind of volunteer effort has the capacity to expand to other sites, I'd always be super interested in adding new sites and adding some new perspectives to the water quality data. One of the unique things about the Santa Maria River system is that um, in the dry season, it really does disconnect between the estuary and everything upstream. So what happens is the, the water from the Sisquak and Kuyama um, end up sinking into the ground and it gets intercepted by wells. Um, it, the water gets pulled out for agriculture and then you know, applied as irrigation, sinks back in and then percolates into the estuary. And so teasing apart what, um, what water sources are contributing, what pollutants or, or what have you into the estuaries is pretty complicated. Um, but if anybody lives you know, near the Sisquoc or near the Kuyama or, or their favorite tributary, and they want to start monitoring their water quality. I'm, I'm all for it and I'll, I'll help with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Virginia, I saw that you wanted to um, say um, something. Um, yes, I just wanted to let the group know that the Natural History Museum in Santa Maria is opening a steelhead watershed exhibit on Earth Day, April 22nd. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Okay, who who else would uh, would like to go? Uh, Anne, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Anne Burdett. I am the secretary of the Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council, and Lewis and I are both the like 
co-chairs of a committee where we're trying to create something like this in Santa Barbara, like a creek stewardship program where community members can help monitor their creeks. And so we're hoping maybe we'll get some ideas for how to do similar things in our area of the county. And also we've been talking about wanting to get involved in North County activities in our board meetings. So hopefully this will be a good opportunity for us to work together. Oh, that's really great to hear. Um, yeah, and I know some people that live along the Sandy Nose River who want the same thing to happen there. But maybe that's a future future idea for Creeklands to, to do that. Um, yeah, we should we should definitely discuss this um, in uh, maybe a separate meeting or something um, where you can kind of talk about the just all the logistics, the background, um, what it takes to run volunteer water quality monitoring um, and kind of it, it, it's always tailored to your goals and, and what you're trying to collect. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, who else wants to jump in? I can go. Um, okay. um, I can introduce myself. My name is Alan Diaz Correa. I am the Climate Justice Associate for the Community Environmental Council. I'm, I'm also an SBCAN board member. Um, and I live in Guadalupe. i uh born and raised here in Santa Maria, um, to be specific. But I also am doing an air quality monitoring project um, out of Guadalupe. And so we have been looking for, uh, at, I've been really excited at providing more scientific opportunities here um, as a, a science lover, you know, and so I'm really excited that SBCAN is doing a similar project here, hosting the this volunteer effort. And so, yeah, I'm just really excited just to see who's attending. You know, I definitely need the contact list. Um, because again, just seeing how much science is happening here in, in this area in particular is really exciting. So um, I think I rambled enough. Uh, I'll leave my email in the chat, but uh, I'm excited to see everyone on Saturday. Thank you, Alan. Um, okay, I'm looking for more volunteers or I'm gonna start calling on people again. Oh, uh, Stephanie has her hand up, please. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Guadalupe and a local artist. I actually grew up in Los Osos and Morro Bay, so I'm kind of familiar with the estuary there. And um, I have a degree in ecology, so this this seems like it's just kind of up my alley. I'm, it's exciting to know that we're looking at the water here. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna call on people. I don't see any more hands. Uh, how about Franz Francisca Camarillo? Did I say that right? Uh, yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, I hope I said that right. <laughs> uh, my name is Francisca Camarillo. I'm a Tequio youth organizer and I work with indig indigenous youth. And uh, we did ask um, a lot of youth if they were interested on our last meeting. Uh, we gave them information about um, you know, that it would be an opportunity to go kayaking and also checking the water quality and a lot of youth were interested. So we're hoping to uh, be able to connect with you, Jenny, um, so that we can get a training as well for the youth. Um, but a, a few of them do speak Spanish. So um, I don't know if we can get the information in Spanish. If not, we would have to kind of like translate it. Um, but, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to this. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to attend on Saturday with youth just because of the safety. You know, the road is closed and we're not able to uh, take the car over there. So probably would wait for the next um, meeting in person for, for in order to be able to access the road. Um, and I'll pass back the word to you, Jenny. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm actually Jeannie. So that's that's okay though. Um, so, um, Miss Teco Youth Organizer is is that with like MECOP or is that with something at, um is there a different organization name for your group? Um yes. So we're Tecchio uh, Youth Program and we're one of the programs that are under the nonprofit organization called Miss Teco Indigena Community Organizing Project, also known as MECOP. 
Okay. And let's see, somebody else here was from Nico. Did he leave? Um, or yes, uh, Leo's still here. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I think we can do something separately. We can talk about translators. Tim, I don't know if you have somebody on your staff that speaks Spanish or if we need to get a translator. Um, yeah, no, nobody fluent enough, but uh, we should work on that. Definitely. If there's, if there's interest, I want to provide that. Okay. So we'll work with you guys on, on setting that up and see how we can facilitate that. Thank you. Yeah. And I just, sorry, I just want to jump in and say that, um, Francisca, the, if the road is not safe to go on, then we won't do the training on Saturday. We'll do it another day. So but we'll, we'll be sure to let you all know. But yeah, we definitely don't want to do anything to put anyone in danger or make anyone feel uncomfortable. And Alan says, Alan says he's happy to facilitate. Is that with translation or? I mean, for like a future event. So we can, you know, I think there's other local Guadalupe folks uh, I know would be interested in getting mm -hmm. students out there, especially Spanish speaking students. So Probably not for next week or for this weekend, but yeah, you can definitely reach out and happy okay. to coordinate. That sounds good. Like a Spanish specific one in the future. Awesome. If we do a, a Spanish one, would it would you want it all in Spanish or would you want it to be bilingual? I think if we could have it in both languages, English and Spanish. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, who hasn't uh, who hasn't introduced themselves yet? Uh, Nadi, you haven't introduced yourself. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I think maybe it says my name is Ken, but my name is Nadia. Um, I'm the advocacy and events director for SB Can. Um, and I've been helping Jeannie with the outreach for this project and um, yeah, I'm excited to be involved. I think it's, SB Can doesn't have a ton of like hands-on projects like this. Usually we're doing more advocacy or policy work, that type of thing. But so I'm excited to do um, some more of the hands-on science-y part of it. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And I know that maybe Fareed, how do you say that? Farida, Fareed, Schroeder had, she can come in and out. Are you there? And would you like to say anything? Yeah, she's probably busy with some, with her class. Yeah, she's so, instructing lab right now. She will not be able to come on. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and Ken, uh, would you like to say? Yeah, I would. Thanks. So I'm I'm Ken Huff, um, executive director with SB Can, and I'm really pleased with this meeting. We've uh, we've not been involved until this project with surface water. We've had a lot of involvement for several years on the groundwater and worrying about the the quality of the groundwater that in the Santa Maria Valley uh, basin that we rely on for ag and for our drinking water. And we worry a lot about the potential contamination from the oil industry to that water, which there's some evidence of that. And so we've harped on that over several years. And this, but this is the first time, and this is a way bigger group of interested people <laughs> that we've got than I ever got on on the other topic that I, I've just mentioned. So I'm really, really pleased uh, everybody's turned out and glad that Jeannie's and, uh, and Nadia are taking the lead on this one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. Um, okay, who have I missed? Who, uh, who has not introduced themselves or made any comments? I think we might have covered everyone. I think we got everybody. Okay. Are there any last comments before we close or questions? Well, I just want to say um, I'm going to work on straightening out the, you know, likelihood that we're going out on Saturday ASAP. I know that people are traveling from some distance um, in, in some cases, and I do not want you to put your plan, your weekend plans on hold for something if uh, we don't know what's going on. So um, hopefully tomorrow, you know, by, by mid-afternoon, we'll have an answer for you. And if it's just looking unsure, um, I, I think we may want to postpone because they're looking at those um, 
drone photos, there's a, a lot of cleanup work to be done. So if they're not working around the clock already, I, I'm not sure when we'll be able to get out there for this weekend. So. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, so we could try to do a little bit of carpooling. I don't if it's this Saturday or if it's another time. And I, I want to offer our next door neighbor who's on this call. Um, we'll give her a ride. Wait, she's not here anymore. But anyway, Virginia lives <laughs> next door. But we should try to, it's a, not that big of a parking lot. And if we had 25 cars, it's full. And if a bunch of Fisher people are out there already, it's really full. So exactly, whoever, yeah. however much we can carpool, if you know some of the other people, let's try and do it. Yeah, and feel free to email me. I can help coordinate that um, if you're, especially if you're coming from the South Coast. I live in Santa Barbara, so I, I'll i be driving up and I have space in my car or um, I know some other people are going up from here too. So, But I can also help coordinate from Santa Maria or other places as well. And I'll put my email in the chat right now if you don't have it already. And my email is in the chat as well. And mine. So uh, you can contact any of us as you as you desire. Okay, well, I'm really excited. I, I'm glad we had we had 30 people on this um, Zoom at one point, and I know some had to leave, um, but that's really exciting. Um, when I started talking with Creeklands about this, they said they could go out there with, with, with as few as two people. So but they said no more than 25 because it would just be too hard to uh, do the instruction. And so I, I aimed for 25, we got 30. And we actually uh, quit trying aggressively to get people about a week ago, but I did go to Hancock today and talk with their, their student leadership group and to see if any of them were interested. But I'm glad to see the great interest. This is a really important uh, issue and exciting. And I wanna thank you all for coming. I Thank you. don't have anything else to say, but if anybody else wants to, please do. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and, and uh, close it out. Uh, we have the recording available if anybody um, wants, uh, wants it, and email us and we'll send it on to you. And thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you hopefully Saturday, but if not, whenever that is. Hopefully soon. Yes, soon. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank Bye. you.